Gracias. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. On, I'll do an introduction. Welcome back to the next episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. And we're going to follow on. We've got a heap load of stuff coming up over the next few weeks. But this week's episode is going to be all around working with addictions in the therapy room. Correct. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for your uh, kind words. Uh, Because at the last podcast, you were saying that uh, you always started with the first, you know, this phrase, wonderful Bob Cook. And I thought about that. Yes, it's a good way to start. It so is. So you have it again. So that's very nice of your kind terminology. I can't think of a better way of describing you, Bob. <laughs> You're just wonderful. So I'm, just I'm not sure whether it was in that last episode that I said, literally, I, I get so much from these podcasts oh. myself. It's it's like a an evolving thing, I, going oh. back to my training. <laughs> well, carry on with the wonderful wonderful terminology. That's absolutely fine. So this podcast is working with addictions people yes. uh that come with addictions so let's start there so when we're talking about addictions there's many varied forms of addictions so we could think of alcohol addiction yeah we could think of drugs addiction we could think of gambling addiction we can think of sex addiction yeah uh, so there's there's you know when we talk about addictions there's many forms of addictions um so I, when i'm going to talk about addictions it covers a wide uh a wide sphere if you like but all addictions in my 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 uh, head are very much about um really their coping mechanisms to survive yeah would well, you put habitual behavior in the same category as addictions or are you talking substance addictions and so give me an example of what you're talking about when you say habitual behaviors did you say um i, I don't know kind of fear of something you know the way when we come up against a block whether that's in therapy or in our personal life limiting beliefs all those sort of things just general habitual behavior i don't see those as addictions okay no i see them as learned behaviors or um, defense systems uh, against actually um, feelings. Okay. Um, so we're talking more substance. I'm really talking about substance abuse. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Whether it be eating addictions, whether it yes. be. Yes. So there's substance abuse, really. Yeah. Um, and as I say, whether we talk about alcohol, eating, or, or many of these different substance abuses, then they're all. Um, ways of coping and surviving um rather than usually feeling yeah so uh you know the big addictions like alcohol uh gambling they 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 are really very very destructive addictions but they are a way of coping rather you know rather than feeling the original trauma i think yeah yeah. Um, is that how you see addictions? Yeah, I I kind of talk with clients about um usually it's a lot of self-medication, you know, not necessarily going to the GP and getting, you know, medication or over the counter. It's kind of self-medicating through various means. Oh, yeah. And uh it's a way of coping. Yes, yeah, definitely. Unfortunately, the way they choose to cope brings um, often physical addiction. Yes. So anybody comes, say, with, uh, let's start with alcohol, for example, um, they will have a physical addiction as well, and they'll get physically addicted to the to the chemical. Yeah. Which is the alcohol, in a sense. Yeah. And I, I suppose, you know, it sounds awful, and I don't want to stereotype, but, you know, there's an awful lot of high-functioning alcoholics out there that it's kind of like the norm to 
to have a day's work and come home and, you know, have a few glasses of wine every night of the week. Yeah, absolutely. And most of these addictions, as I say, whether it's um, whether it's gambling, whether it's sex addictions, whether it's eating addictions, um, you, you get again a continuum yes. of um, people who, who, from high functioning, if you like, to the other end of the continuum. So you're quite correct. So you get high functioning adult alcohol, you know, alcoholics or people drink problems. That's correct. Yeah. And they and if we take alcohol, alcohol particularly, of course, as I say, there's a physical addiction as well. So coming off alcohol, going to rehab and coming off alcohol, the first thing you would have to deal with is the physical addiction and physical withdrawal, which is very, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I can remember when I was in my training and, you know, we did a session and you probably don't remember it. Um, I'm an ex smoker. I used to be a smoker when I did my training. I was a smoker. And I think it was kind of a, a bit of a, a, an eye opener when you referred to it as an addiction. And I didn't really equate the two together. Mm. That's how I see it. Yeah, because yeah. it's a way of taking the person away usually from feelings again but again with smoking of course as a with physical part of it again yes yeah so i don't know if you still are smoking but if, if you if you were or if you are if somebody attempts to stop smoking you know they have a physical withdrawal from the nicotine which is why you've got the move to vaporing yes yeah and i think that was probably what I was saying about, you know, habitual behaviour. I'm an ex-smoker now, I don't smoke. Um, but it was it was the habit that was harder for me to, to overcome rather than the nicotine addiction. I found that bit quite easy, which shocked me. Which, which did you find easy? Getting over the nicotine addiction was the easy part. Breaking the habit of when I smoked, you know, and things like that, I found more difficult. Yeah, I mean, interesting, I mean, uh, uh, about this, because, of course, with smoking, and, of course, if we think of drugs, think of weed, if we think of cannabis, if we think of heroin, many, m many of those, there's a social habit that goes with it. Yeah. And if we look, think of smoking, but I say you could put the other, other medications in the same bracket, there's a social part to it. Yeah. So maybe what you're talking about, with your smoking is the habit that's linked to the social companionship yeah not yeah yeah know. yeah but e even lesser than that yeah i suppose you know with the ha the alcohol i i don't i don't particularly like drinking but you know the the connections we make to certain things that it helps me relax it helps me sleep better. The kind of stories that we we say to ourselves around certain substances mm. helps us switch off. Yeah, yeah. You might say to yourself. Yeah. And of course, alcohol does have that effect of knocking you out. It numbs. Not, yeah. Yeah, and particularly knocking out the parent part, and often the critical narratives that go with that. Interesting. So in transaction analysis, of course, we're going to use that model, which I often refer to. Yeah. Um, alcohol and many of the, and many of the other medications I was thinking of knocks out or, or will knock out the internal, often critical, toxic narratives and gives the person some relief from um, those internal narratives which they've internalised. Yeah. Interesting. And of course, therapeutically, um, once you've dealt with the physical part of this, which I was just talking to, you would um, probably move next to help him desensitize uh, or at least look at the parental toxic narratives um, that they that they deal with, uh, which is usually um, actioned under stress. So under stress, they're usually very hard on themselves. And when you actually do the therapeutic work, you get down to the 
internalized critical parents, which they've internalized, uh, which then gives them such a hard time, which is why they turn to medication to um, knock out the parental voices, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe once you start to understand the process of that, that it is the, you know, the internal self-talk, the internal dialogue that's, you know, perpetuating the cycle, so to speak. So what, what would you kind of say to a client? Would you encourage self-compassion? And because I would imagine if it's a critical parent that's talking, then we're probably going to be more in our rebellious child when we're succumbing to that, possibly. I know for smoking, I was definitely in my rebellious child. Yeah, so in classical treatment, whether it be alcohol, whether it's smoking, whether it's gambling or all these different things, um, we would be looking at what is often called in transaction analysis, hungers. And one of the hungers, of course, is a hunger for stimulus. Now, at a normal level, we'll, we all have a drive for stimulus. However, um, you know, the, if the, the stimulus is the negative critical parent, then the younger part of ourselves goes into hiding and certainly wants to knock out the critical parent. So in transaction analysis therapy, once you've actually identified that process that the person's attempting to knock out through drugs or whatever it is, then you can start to um, help the client get in touch with the dialogue in their head. And once you can help the client understand or take ownership that it's not actually them, it's not actually them that's giving themselves a hard time. It's actually, you know, the the the, the uh, critical parent or critical other that they've internalised. Yeah. Then, you, then you can help the younger part of themselves or a different part of themselves empower themselves to be able to turn off, if you like, or turn down the voices in their head so they don't have to turn to drink or medication or drugs to do that. They can yeah. take power themselves or to find a less destructive coping mechanism. So in other words, you know, going for walks, or going to the gym, or, or 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 whatever we're talking about here, but not so destructive as the original coping mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. So, would you recommend a substitution for it then, like that, going for walk, meditation, going yeah, to the well, gym? Yeah. There's an article by people who was listening to this podcast. There's an article by someone called Jody Marjula. Um, she's a TA therapist. And um, she writes an article, which I quite like, called Appetite Paths. And what she's talking about is the TA therapist with the client identifies the destructive coping mechanisms that they're actually uh, using, whatever it is, um, to help them, in this sense, desensitize the parental toxic critical narratives um, and then substitutes them with less destructive ones. So if, if for example, is you know getting drunk or taking heroin or whatever it is that they actually do, which is so destructive, of course, if they can find a less destructive one, uh, which is you know perhaps a little bit more healthy, it doesn't mean it's actually all you know completely. Yeah, yeah. At least it's a substitute yeah. uh, surviving mechanism. Um, then she would advocate that. Yeah. Which makes sense, really, because, you know, what one of the things when, again, I'm only talking about smoking, but when we stop doing certain things, it's kind of like there's a big hole there. <laughs> you know, what, one of my things was that whenever I was on the phone, I would smoke a cigarette and suddenly it was kind of like, well, what do I do now? Correct. They needed to, so you need a different stimulus. Yes. Yeah. I talked about stimulus hunger. Yeah. Earlier on, and you need a stimulus which isn't so dramatic. Yes. A stimulus that's not so unhealthy. A stimulus which is uh, that you can take ownership of in a less destructive way. So, yeah. um, I don't know which what coping mechanism you chose, but um, 
that would be the work of a therapist to actually discover a less destructive coping mechanism or a different habit, which is a habit which is less um, harmful. Yeah. So that might be, I mean, I said going walking, but that might be going to the, uh, that might be going to the cinema, that might be finding ways to distract yourself, which isn't so harmful, but that would be an inquiry with your own therapist to start, you know, going left to a le left instead of right. In other words, yes. not going right to the health, to the unhealthy destructive patterns, but going left to a, you know, a different type of uh, substitute behavior, which isn't so harmful. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you think it links in some way, you know, wh whatever the addiction with, I'm not sure the best way of saying it, whether it's a lack of self-esteem or self-worth or self-care that the person doesn't put great importance on themselves to give them as much incentive to stop the, you know, destructive behaviour. Does that make sense? Makes complete sense. And this can also be a, the addiction can be escape, can be an escape from, visiting the earlier trauma it doesn't have to be necessarily linked to pure uh, self-esteem or worthlessness or or, or, or or what we're talking about here but it could be a escape from feeling whatever the trauma was so I was just thinking people who suffer from post-traumatic stress will often turn yeah. to addictions drinking gambling all the things that we talked about yeah instead of revisiting the trauma yeah or a day or a way of dealing with flashbacks or a way of dealing with um revisiting the very traumatic times so that's one avenue yeah the, the other the other avenue of course i was talking earlier on about if you've got a if you're very hard on yourself by continuing to tell yourself off which really comes from an internalized parent figure, I believe, then it's a way of escaping from those voices, isn't it? Yes. So, yes. so you're correct. If you've always got those voices bearing down on you, then your self-confidence and self-esteem will, will, will be very high. You know, you will think, very little of yourself because you've always got oh. these voices telling you how worthless you are and what a sh well how terrible person you are or yeah. whatever it is um so in that sense self-confidence will be very low yeah and you know again i think it was probably something that you pointed out to me in my training that the alcohol the smoking you know maybe unhealthy eating habits things like that it's it's a quite a subtle form of self-harm as well oh well, yes it is and i had a i did an assessment with somebody the other day and she was quite sophisticated in some sense and in other words she'd reflected on herself and she she came in and talked about her addiction and she talked about it as a way of dealing with um the neglect with neglect from her childhood which she saw as very traumatic. Mm. And what she meant by that was, it, you know, by eating, uh, eating the neglect away. In other words, that's the way she talked. By eating and purging, she was actually eating those feelings and she didn't have to go near the trauma. Yeah. Most eating issues or eating problems, whether it's bulimia or anorexia, is a way of dealing with um, feelings. Yeah. Anorexia particularly is to do with a parent, child, and TA terms, again, battle over food. And it's a way of keeping someone very young and infantilized and the parents taking control. The food becomes the battleground. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think we've done a podcast on eating. We um, did, we did quite a few back. Yeah. But, but it's uh, it's kind of the the addiction side of it you know can be seen as as self-harm there's yeah. 
there's a lot of young people now that are you know cooking yeah. and yeah. those sort of things yeah. which is the obvious it is self-harm jackie I, I i'm not disagreeing with you at all um in the sense of you know what we're talking about in, in very unhealthy destructive patterns yeah and, and it's a way of coping uh and not feel so they don't have to feel or visit their highly traumatic past so yes it is self-harming and at another level yeah it's it's a defense system so they don't have to visit those traumatic you know uh, now of course the destructive destructive patterns they may knock out the traumatic um experiences that they may knock out those horrendous voices or they may knock out um having to visit the neglect or whatever it is and the destructive patterns themselves can cause horrendous problems mm. yeah and then they feel unable you know to be able to stop the addictions or they have to then go to uh, another level of different addictions and so those behaviors become so extremely you know um difficult in the present um that they become i wouldn't say worse than the original trauma but they become uh, a difficult process to handle in, in, in the present but they start off as a way to cope with you know difficult times and difficult traumas and oh. parental voices in their heads and goodness knows what is that self-harm well it starts off in the world of protection i think it might end up to be seen as self-harm yeah but it's a desperate attempt to cope in a world which has often been so horrendous that they don't know how to cope so in other words they are survival mechanisms which turn into what people might see as self-harm. Yeah. They didn't start off like that. Yeah. And again, I suppose touching on the hungers and the need for stimulation, you know, it with younger people nowadays, the the peer pressure to do certain things also plays a part potentially in future addiction. You know that 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 with Maslow's hierarchy of need, the need to belong. When we're you know talking about maybe younger kids smoking weed or smoking or vaping and all those sorts of things. Yes, and absolutely, and um, I could agree more with you. Um, I'm seeing an increasing amount of of children and parents where that is one of the main concerns that the parent is having is that the child is experimenting with certain substances and what do you see as the and what do you as a psychotherapist what do you see as the treatment then well you know luckily unfortunately for me the the conversations that we're having with the parents is very open and i think that you know with young people that's one of the main things is that there are open you know, avenues of communication and exploring the reasons why, you know, is it peer pressure? Are they feeling under pressure? Is there something going on? You know, so so not necessarily focusing on the substance, but more what's surrounding the child at the moment, whether, you know, it is a way of avoiding something for them. Yeah. That's Whereas right. I think parents go into fear mode, oh my God, it, you know, they've just, add a joint or something and that's where the focus is rather than looking a bigger picture maybe yes i agree with you and in the world of reality tv and the search for that narcissistic culture i think which is promoted by uh, the present social media uh, unfortunately we see more and more of this mm. I mean, what's good is, uh, what is positive, is that the people who, uh, and parents, if you want to put it in that way, are to seek help more. Seek, yes, you know, yeah. Help's more accessible. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think completely what you're saying, you know, the, the world of reality TV and social media and things like that, 
it's we, we we're seeing behind closed doors a lot more than what we used to do you know my children have a completely different lifestyle to what I did it you know everything's in full view now well much more than our generation mm. I still think a lot happens behind closed doors definitely but you know if if I made a mistake not a lot of people knew about it if somebody else makes a mistake now it's pretty much all over Facebook instantly yeah that's well it can be I was just thinking about um the highest rate of suicide uh believe it or not is with young men under 35 mm -hmm. Which is, I think is very indicative of what we're talking about in, here in terms of the culture and things like this. And, you know, the, the turn to medication, to addictions, to alcohol, or whatever it is we're talking about here, I just want to reiterate, is a way to knock out or in this huge despair, uh, a huge um, attempt to not have to visit their traumatic past yeah um i was thinking of you know the the the, the suicide rates hang you know and uh, people who 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 desperately um turn to me many levels of addictions so they don't have to visit their traumatic past yeah. and the therapy is about actually helping them have an awareness of this and an understanding of this and helping them actually understand how the past affects the present and finding different ways of handling this. And this is why my colleague, Jody Marjulu, who wrote that article, Appetite Paths, when she talks about, and she ran addiction sentence, by the way, uh, she talked about helping people understand that and helping them find substitute coping mechanisms which weren't so unhealthy as the destructive ones which we were talking about earlier on yeah and from that it's like going down layers of onions until they find uh, mechanisms at a far less um unhealthy way yeah. So that's that's her treatment. And alongside that, looking at the what I was just talking about, the internalized negative critical voices, which often um, run the show and how they can be empowered to have more self-confidence um, to desensitize these voices so they can live a healthy life. Yeah. Which can all be done in the therapy room. Yes, and it, uh, and you know sometimes the people are so addicted, as I said, with the physical addictions as well, uh, that they have to go. That there is that there isn't enough resources. Uh, so in other words, the therapist can only offer them at the most probably two hours a week or maybe one. So you might have to recommend them to go into rehab mm. or a, a process where they can actually uh, be in a community or somewhere where there's a, a lot more resources around than the private therapist that can only offer one or two hours a week. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there, there is an added bonus to being in a group with addiction? You know, like Alcoholics well, Anonymous or things. Yeah, therapeutic community. Yeah. Especially yeah. rehab. If you can afford it, or if you can, or I mean, there are government, you know, I was thinking of local government rehabs, especially around alcohol and especially around uh, drugs. Um, if you can get into a, a rehab where the, there's 24 hours of resources or there's access to resources on one hour a week, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because then they've got tapped to a lot of resources, which, you know, Therapist is really limited, aren't they, Jackie? To one hour, no. two hour a week. What, at one level, is better than nothing, but certainly 
if you can get them into what I would call rehab, all the better. Yeah, yeah. And in a supportive group as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, if he, if he, yes, it's another scale, very much a supportive group. I mean, the wonderful thing about AA, for example, or, or even the, the, uh, the, 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 the groups that have started off for codependency and things like this, is um, that all their, 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 their processes will, will actually be offering groups as well. In AA, you have to, you know, you go to a group. Yeah, yeah. Do the 12 steps with the group. Yeah. It's not enough just individually. Yeah. So to just to, to finish up on, on this, you, is, is there any kind of overall advice that you would give to therapists working with addictions? Would it would it be to offer, you know, one or two sessions a week? Would it be to to have them within a group setting? Well, number one, I think, is to see these addictions as a way to cope, not to see it around self-harm, to see them as desperate coping mechanisms to get by. And so that's if you start from that place, you're starting from a compassion approach. Yeah. OK, if you're starting from that, then you need to help the person take ownership of their own narrative their own story and i think then you help them look for uh, more healthy uh, coping mechanisms and then you help them look at you know what is what's happened in their history this has been so traumatic and so difficult and and if that's going to take a rehab if that's going to take two or three sessions if that's going to take resources that you haven't got you refer on yeah if that means they go to a where there's much more resources and there's groups and there's 12 step programs refer them on yeah because most psychotherapists they haven't got it's a first step but they haven't got the resources they've only got an hour or two hours a week now that's better than nothing. And if a person won't go into rehab, if they won't go to group, if they won't go to a 12 step program, then it's certainly better than nothing, but I would be encouraging them all the time to look for more resources as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it might be worth just mentioning on this, which I know we did way, way, way back on earlier podcasts about, um, contracting maybe that they're not under the influence of anything when they come and attend um therapy absolutely um, which again you know might be a weekly contract that you do every week that they're gonna you know not touch the substance between sessions if that's you seeing them twice a week oh. yeah it's a difficult one um many therapists won't see people who have severe drink problems until they're at least six months clean wow so the same with drugs as well so different therapists have different frameworks yeah and you can't work with somebody who's under the influence whether it be alcohol or drugs um and why some people won't work with people who have you know life has to be six months clean because that will show motivation number one it would show um, a willingness to change. It would show, you, you know, that the, the therapy has a chance from an adult to adult perspective. So different therapists have different thought processes around this. I believe if we're talking about deep addiction, whether it be alcohol or medication, it'd be better if you can get them into some process where there's a group, and where there's more resources. It's very difficult for an individual therapist to offer the resources needed to help with somebody who's a you know, a well-functioning al al alcoholic or somebody who, who's a well-functioning drug addict. I mean, it's a difficult story, actually. Yeah, the, yeah. The day. There are lots of layers to this and, you know, and I suppose, again, you know, because I, I am a, you know, a, a single person that works from home, you need to prioritise your own self-care as well if you are working with people that, 
potentially could be under the influence of something when they come to see you. Absolutely. And I think that's different from dealing with smoking addiction, for example. Yeah. Now on my YouTube channel, Bob Cook, you will see a video of me working with somebody to help them um, therapeutically, to help them with their smoking addiction and um, an example of what we do. And I think that's a different level for somebody, yeah. from somebody who's, say, you know, a raging alcoholic or somebody who is hooked onto heroin. Yeah. At different levels. Definitely. Yeah. And like you said, there's a spectrum, there's a sliding scale with a lot of this. Yeah. And so therapists should have a list of resources and organizations to be able to send these people to. Yeah. Yeah. And again, working within your own skill set and knowing what your limitations are as a, a you know, a practicing therapist. Couldn't agree more. Brilliant. So what are we going to do the next episode, okay. Bob? Yeah, are yeah. we doing working with challenging clients next? Yeah, that's the next one. So I look okay. forward to talking about that. Okay. See you on the next episode. See you on the next one. You've been listening to The Therapy Show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode